Welcome everybody back into Nerd Sesh. As always, I'm Carson Breber and alongside me is Logan Camden. And we are here again from Blue Wire Studios in Las Vegas at Summer League. Today, we are going to be ranking our top five NBA title contenders for next season. With the offseason mostly wrapped up, obviously, there is still the one major question of where Damian Lillard finds himself playing next season. Certainly looks like the Miami Heat. But Logan, want to hear your list. Let's start with your toughest cut. Who was that? So I had two really tough cuts, Carson, and I want to get them out of the way first. Uh, my first cut, the Phoenix Suns. I have them at number seven, and I'm just concerned if they can pressure the rim enough next season. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a team that in the playoffs, they were in the 30th percentiles among playoff teams of uh, at-rim attempts. They were in the 99th percentile of mid-range shots in the playoffs. 53.6% of their shots came in the mid-range, and they just added a guy in Bradley Beal who takes 46% of his shots from the mid-range. That's also in the 97th percentile. So I worry about their depth and their bench. I worry about this offense being dynamic, and I worry about this defense reaching a high enough ceiling to be competitive. So I just need to see it from Phoenix mm -hmm. to believe in it. So they're going to be number seven. My toughest cut was the Golden State Warriors, and I think they can reach a really high defensive peak. They're bringing back Draymond Green. That was a uh, huge piece. They needed to bring him back. And now Chris Paul is going to take over for those non-Steph minutes. I think they're important additions, but I, I'm i just concerned with them having reliable scoring outside of Steph. And when yeah. it comes down to crunch time in the playoffs, if they're going to be able to yeah create reliable offense consistently enough, Golden State's one of the best perimeter scoring teams in the NBA. I fully expect that. Steph's one of the best offensive players on planet Earth, but uh, they were outsized by L.A., uh, yeah. And they just weren't able to create consistent, reliable offense. Uh, and that's my real chief concern with Golden State. I think that they're, I think they need to do something else before the season starts. I just don't have complete faith in them. So they're not going to be one of my top five contenders today. So I would flip the order of these two, but I think they probably belong in the six and seven spot. I think the Suns have the higher ceiling of these two. I really don't think the Warriors have addressed their fundamental issues. I mm -hmm. think size is an absolute killer. And when you're looking at what's going to dictate the Western Conference, the Nuggets and the Lakers are massive. They are physical. They're going to dominate on the glass. The Lakers particularly have great defensive personnel. And the Warriors just weren't equipped to battle in those arenas last year. The secondary shot creation, I think CP brings a valuable element, particularly for the second unit. Obviously can still create good looks for himself and others out of pick and roll. Not a guy who I want consistently bearing the load of a second creator. Not a guy who is overly complimentary to Steph, just not being a great off-ball player. A defensive liability at this stage. So... I like what the Warriors did in the draft with some of their moves on the peripheries of the roster, like Brandon Podzemski, I think, is a really good offensive fit. Trace Jackson Davis, I think, can be an immediate rotational big. But I just don't think they really meaningfully addressed the biggest issues that they have. And when it comes to the Suns, I mean, the major selling point here is obviously mm -hmm. just incredible star shot making and plus playmaking from all of the members of their big three. They have the best scoring duo in the league. I think one of the best ever and the best offensive number three in basketball. So that's the reason they're in these conversations. The issue is that they are basically below the pack in every other category. And what cost them this year was not their ability to create high-level offense. Even though they had some lulls with their inability to pressure the rim, they had the number three offensive rating in this playoff field. Mm -hmm. It was their issues in terms of size, physicality, defense, the ability to do the little things. And yeah, their biggest issue was how do we break these lulls? How do we pressure the rim? They were dead last in restricted area makes last year. Book is around 75th in the league in restricted area field goals made. KD is 150. Beal is the best of the group, but it's still far from like his primary strength. Then you have the fit between the stars. All of them are good off ball. You have lots of good off ball movement and cutting and capable spot up shooting from all these guys, but it's not how you maximize any of their value. And there's just inherent redundancies there with all three of them eating up so many minutes. And although I like how they've improved with very limited resources in terms of depth, the Eric Gordon signing, Kata Bates Diop, I actually really like for the mm -hmm. front court. Yudu Watanabe is a fine guy who's going to at least bring shooting. Eubanks is another capable front court option. Like they've done a good job, but they were coming from a truly abysmal place. I still don't think they compare to any of the teams we'll talk about in terms of high impact role guys and sheer quality players. Like they're just 
not matching up because they have gone so all in in terms of financial investment on their top four guys. I don't think Aiden is a guy who I consistently trust to play at that high two-way level and to compensate for their shortcomings elsewhere in terms of defensive personnel and physicality and all those things. So I think the Suns are going to be really good, Mm -hmm. but when it comes to things that win you championships, it's not just about how consistently can we have star creation from these guys who we know are capable of getting mid-range buckets relentlessly. A lot of it is about the little things and the two-way ceiling, and I'm not convinced there. So who do you have in the five spot? At number five, I have the team that was just in the Western Conference Finals. I have the Los Angeles Lakers, okay. and I think they had basically a perfect offseason. They retain Austin Reeves on one of the best value deals uh, in all of basketball. They bring back Hachimura. Uh, they add in Gabe Vincent to the fold, Tari and Prince, uh, Jackson Hayes, Cam Reddish. I think this team matches up defensively and size-wise uh, with anybody in the league. The Lakers are going to be a physical team. They're going to be great defensively. They're super long, uh, and that's really their strengths. I have two major questions for L.A., and that's primarily what version of the stars that we get out of them. Like, is LeBron going to be uh, the best version of LeBron? Is his jump shot going to be on? Can he impose his will on the game and control the way uh, LeBron controls basketball games? That's Probably my biggest question for L.A. If that box is checked, the only other one is, uh, what version of Anthony Davis do we get, and can mm-hmm. he slow down Nikola Jokic? I know he got, he kind of got sunned by Jokic a little bit. Jokic is rocking him. AD was his little baby, but I don't think AD gave his best effort. I think Anthony Davis is the best defensive player on planet Earth, and I think he can slow down Jokic a little more. I think size-wise, they match up really well with Denver and basically any other team in the league. I just have... Major questions about the variables that LeBron and AD are. My other thing is perimeter creation throughout uh, this roster. I trust mm-hmm. Austin Reeves. I like Gabe Vincent. What D low are we going to get? But uh, either way, I think LA set themselves up for a lot of success. If any of these guys are struggling through the season, these are all really movable contracts where you can go out and get another major asset. Like yeah. these are movable pieces that people will want. Um, yeah, but the biggest question for me is what we get out of LeBron, what we get out of AD, how healthy they are. But I really do think the Lakers are a legitimate title contender, and I think a lot of people are sleeping on them, man. I'm a little higher on the Lakers than you are, okay. even. I have them in my fourth spot, and I've been a real believer in this core after the deadline. I viewed them as a front runner in the Western Conference, and I think that their Western Conference Finals run was very legit. They obviously got swept, but they played Denver more competitively in terms of the consistency game to game and just the flat out point differential than any other team. In the entire playoff field, I think they have an elite defensive ceiling with a top three defensive anchor on the planet. Mm -hmm. I think they have tremendous physicality and size advantages over basically everybody but Denver. And I think that they do have really good depth with a lot of those impact role guys. Reeves is a legit strong number three Mm -hmm. in this playoff field. And Rui is going to bring that defensive versatility, the ability to attack mismatches, to be a big-time shot maker. Vincent, I think, is a guy who gives their secondary creation core a higher floor because D'Lo, there's nights where he's flat out unplayable. Like, if he just can't hit a shot, if he's making bad decisions, Gabe Vincent is so much steadier. And I think having an option like that really matters and could have, frankly, made them fare much better in that Denver series because D'Lo was an abomination and they just didn't have other options to turn to. But Torian Prince is going to bring more shooting on the wings. Vando, matchup to matchup, isn't always playable, but does have pretty exceptional defensive value in certain situations. So I like their secondary creation. I don't think it's like uh, an elite strength because of D'Lo's inconsistency, but it really does come down to what versions of LeBron and AD you're going to get because they potentially have two top 10 players. And I think the Lakers will go as far as those guys can take them. There's not really glaring weaknesses on this roster. To me, maybe you could look at perimeter shooting. They were mediocre Mm -hmm. there last year, but I'm not overly concerned about it. I do think it limits their dynamism, and that's one thing about this Lakers offense, and it limited them throughout this past season. They ended up being an average playoff offense. Everything is a grind. It is very much about getting into that painted area. Their guards love to operate out of pick and roll and get to the mid-range and the floaters. And so... They just don't have the ability to go on these sort of effortless runs that like Denver can with their shooting ceiling or Boston can when they're dialed in and 
they're getting the high level scoring from their top wings, but also all the catch and shooting is going. So I do think that's something to note. It's just a bit easier for some of these other teams to hum offensively. It's always kind of a grind for the Lakers, but it's going to come down to LeBron and AD's consistency for an entire run because they both had exceptional moments. I thought AD through the first two rounds played maybe the best defensive postseason that I could think of, but then absolutely was totally outclassed in the Jokic matchup, and offensively, I thought, was too inconsistent in terms of his aggression, relying on his touch shot making that isn't always going to be high level, and he ends up being a 21-point-per-game guy in this playoff run. That's just not enough. LeBron had spectacular moments where he was dialed in and he was really abusing his physical advantages and maximizing his playmaking impact, attacking out of the post, and where his jump shot was falling. Like, Game 6 against the Warriors was great LeBron. Game Mm -hmm. 4 against the Nuggets was great LeBron. But bottom line, he was a 24-point-per-game guy on okay efficiency. Very good. Top 12 player in the league. Not the kind of LeBron James that they need if they want to win a title. And for him being another year older, it's just completely unprecedented territory. And so I do believe in this Lakers team. I do think they check a whole lot of boxes, physicality, defensive ceiling, secondary creation, fine shooting at the very least, and big physical guys at the top who can attack the paint. And... uh, For that reason, I am high on them, but it's going to come down to can LeBron and AD be better for an entire playoff run, and that's on both of them, than they were this year. So I have the Lakers in the four spot. Who do you have in the four spot? Uh, At number four, I have the Milwaukee Bucks, and I think there are some things that you can rely on with Milwaukee, uh, primarily their defense. I don't know if they're going to run as heavy drop. It really worked during the regular season. It's worked for them for a while with Mike Budenholzer. Uh, Now that he's out, uh, I don't know if they're going to run that same stuff, but I still think this is going to be an elite defense. You have one of the best defensive players on planet Earth in Giannis Antetokounmpo. Brooke Lopez was a phenomenal rim protector. Again, even though it's coming out of that drop, you have, uh, in my opinion, uh, probably the best guard, uh, defending guard in all of basketball, and Drew Holiday, too. This defense is going to be great. What slowed them down in the playoffs this year was that late-game offense. I mean, they had the clutch offensive mm-hmm. rating of below 80. It was a lot of Giannis creating from the perimeter, And I just don't think that's the most conducive to great late-game offense. You have Chris Middleton, who, while he struggled during the regular season, was great in the playoffs, 24-6-6, really efficiently. You also have Drew Holiday, who, in a pinch, I think is really underrated at going out and getting his own buckets. I trust Drew Holiday to get downhill and go through contact to get uh, points. So I think they're going to clean that up. My big question marks are if Chris Middleton can stay healthy. Injuries have been a really big issue with him and... I wonder how this knee surgery affects Giannis. Giannis underwent a procedure where they're going out in his knee and they're going to clean it out. I just don't know how that's going to affect him, if that's a really big deal, but it does raise a flag in my mind of, is Giannis going to be fully healthy for this season? Is he going to be okay? Obviously, he missed some time in the playoffs with that injury, too. Those are my major concerns, and just them aging. This is an old group, Uh, but I think they're going to be rock solid defensively. You have a lot of shooting around Giannis. Giannis is one of the best defensive collapsers in all of basketball. He's just plain, he's plain and simply, he's one of the three best players on planet Earth. I'm going to bank on that. I'm going to bank on the defense being great. And they are very much in, in title contention. I don't think their depth is as good as, in, as it was in recent years. But I still think this is going to be a great team. I just think there's, a, there's an offensive ceiling if they choose to run through Giannis once more. I think they need to lean on Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday a little bit more in those mm. big situations. And, yeah, just, just depend on them a little bit more when Giannis is struggling like that. So I have the Bucks at five which is a real markdown from how I felt about them for most of this year because going into the playoffs, they were my title favorite. I am definitely concerned about the half-court offense, and similarly to the Lakers, it's like a real grind for the Mm -hmm. Bucs in a way that it isn't for the top three teams. The problem is I don't think that they have two creators at the top of the caliber of LeBron and AD. I don't like their secondary creation as much. I have real concerns about playoff Drew, dude. I think... We have seen now for three straight postseasons, he struggles to score with any sort of efficiency. He's under 48% true shooting. And I think there's some very clear reasons for that. He's not a good pull-up jump shooter. He's not a high-end athlete. He doesn't pressure the rim consistently. So you end up with these sort of eh looks from him, often from the perimeter repeatedly. I don't really like Drew in a high-volume role. And I think Giannis... I don't want to overreact to just three games of him in that context, but it's like every limitation of his was exposed in the most embarrassing way Mm -hmm. possible in terms of his limitations as a half court creator. The free throw shooting is one thing. His playmaking wasn't good enough. Almost as many turnovers as assists in that series, but really against a great one-on-one defender 
like Bam, where he was not able to simply overpower him physically in that half-court context, his game kind of crumbled. And when he doesn't have that like consistently elite option to turn to, especially given Middleton's availability concerns, mm -hmm. which you touched on, he's played in 40 of 99 games since the start of the 2022 playoffs when he missed the majority of that run. And consistently this year, it was like he was back in the lineup on a minutes restriction, but he couldn't ever get fully healthy. Playoffs was the best that he looked. Now he had another surgery after the playoff run. As an aging guy in his 30s, I think that's a legitimate concern. So I just don't really like the half-court mm -hmm. offense from them as much as my top three teams. That being said, I think they have a very high defensive ceiling. I think that they have great size as well. I think the overall talent level of their top seven is super impressive. The big three of Holiday, Middleton, and Giannis. Of course, Brooke Lopez is one of the best fourth options in the league. And then you have the shooting from Grayson Allen and Pat Connaughton. Bobby Portis is one of the better do-it-all sixth men in basketball. And Giannis ultimately has led to great regular season teams every year of his career because he is the most unstoppable physical force with above average shooting alongside him. No Javon Carter coming back. No Joe Ingles coming back. I still think this is a good shooting core, not a great one. But I am concerned about that half-court offensive creation. And I'm concerned about the aging, too. I want to see some more malleability with them. Schematically, I think it'll be interesting to see how Adrian Griffin compares to Mike Budenholzer. But also defensively, are there combinations where they can go out there and excel without Brooke Lopez? Because we've seen Giannis at the five lineups in the past do well there. I think Andre Jackson, who they mm -hmm. picked up in the draft this year, is going to be potentially an important weapon there. Great, versatile defensive piece. Really good athlete. Very good playmaker offensively. I do worry about his spot-up shooting limitations, but is there a way that you can play in a series against a Miami where they were so reliant on their pull-up shooting, not like a great rim-pressuring team, and you can take Brooke Lopez off the floor in those stretches and still put together a really strong defensive unit? I ultimately left this playoff run from Milwaukee with more questions than I did resounding positive answers. And I think they're all legitimate concerns. So I am definitely lower on them right now than I was throughout last regular season. Who do you have in your three spot? Uh, at number three, I have the Boston Celtics. And I'll tell you right now, Carson, I think the Boston Celtics are going to disappoint me more than any other team in basketball again. Uh -huh. They're just super inconsistent. On paper, year in, year out, this is one of the most talented teams in the league. And it's frustrating because one night, like you said, dude, they can go on barrages on these insane runs that where they're hitting every three. They're playing great defense. They're getting out in transition, and it is easy. They will blow a team out. You're sitting there going, this is the best team in the league by yeah. far. They're going to run away to the championship. Uh, they added Kristaps Porzingis in the offseason. I think they got a lot better with that move. I think uh, you got a lot of guards on this roster uh, with Malcolm Brogdon, Derek White, Marcus Smart is not as important to this core. I think you needed to add a little more offensive versatility. Porzingis, for one, is going to be a much better catch-and-shooter than Al Horford. Horford was below 30% in these playoffs. That's not going to happen to Kristaps. He's a great shooter. He also is going to bring some versatility in terms of post-touches. Like, he's a good post-hub. Uh, I don't think a lot of people watched Washington Wizards basketball last year. He was 89th percentile as a post score. Minimum three possessions a game was the second most efficient post-up score in basketball behind Nikola Jokic. So I think he brings a little more versatility there. I think he brings some nice size, some defensive length too, where uh, with Rob Williams, you've got a lot of rim protection there. I do think the Celtics got better. But I wonder about the Tatum and Brown fit. And again, I just worry about them in terms of consistency in late game situations. The Boston Celtics have repeatedly showed us that they're not reliable in these late-game situations. If it's Jason Tatum crumbling, if it's Jalen Brown crumbling uh, with these bad turnovers, I don't know the solution there. And like a lot of people have noted, I don't know if either of these guys are number ones. In those late-game situations, it's time to take over, put games away, put the other team to bed, and take them down. Uh, I think they've got uh, solid depth here. I think they are one of the most talented teams on paper in basketball. I think it'll be great in the regular season again. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to buy in and get fooled again. The Boston Celtics have fooled me both of these past two years. They're teetering on that sixer scale for me, Carson, where I don't mm. want to buy in again. I like the move for Porzingis. I want to see how that affects this team, but I still wonder about the Tatum and Brown fit. I worry about them in late-game situations. I worry about them being consistently locked in night to night and digging themselves holes that they can't get out of. They almost dug uh, their own grave against Philly. They definitely did it against Miami by going down 0-3. So a lot of those same concerns are still there for me with Boston. 
Here's the thing that's so tricky with Boston, who I also have in my number three spot. We talk about them underachieving and disappointing, and they were in the finals two years ago, and they were in Game 70 Eastern Conference Finals mm -hmm. this year because their talent level is arguably the best in the league, and their best punch is arguably the best in the league. Like, just the top six of Tatum, Brown, Porzingis, White, Rob Williams, and Malcolm Brogdon is obscene. Mm -hmm. Like, they are, in so many ways, close to the prototypical modern basketball team with the two elite scoring wings with very good catch and shooters and very good secondary ball handlers around them. But their fundamental issues do remain unaddressed. I think KP is going to add important scoring versatility because I don't know that their issues this year were primarily about the offensive end. I think it was really about their defensive consistency. But their shooting lulls and their inability to work their way out of that like if it was just relying too heavily on the pull-up shooting or even when they were generating some solid driving kick looks but they weren't falling or if they were settling for too many of those one-pass catch and shoots against the Miami zone, they just didn't have the other thing to turn to. And so they just kind of went down with the ship in terms of relying heavily on that perimeter shooting. And I think KP is a guy who you can utilize in a bunch of ways. Very good screener. And, well, not necessarily the active screening itself, but score out of screening actions if it's as a roller or even more deadly as a popper. Very good post-up score. Very good spot-up shooter. I don't want to just pretend that Al Horford wasn't great there for the regular season. Mm -hmm. He was, and he was 44% from deep. But, yeah, he was really brutal in the postseason. KP is a great shooter of the basketball. And he's going to add length and athleticism defensively. So you are still able to get those two big looks that Horford and Rob Williams bring you in certain matchups. Could be very important against, like, a Giannis mm -hmm. and maybe Denver size if they were to get to the finals and you have way more offensive pop. And this team just has a tremendously high defensive ceiling. Like if they're all engaged, you have an elite defensive guard in Derek White. You have an elite defensive wing in Jason Tatum. You have a pretty elite defensive big in Rob Williams with like overall pluses from Jalen Brown and Kristaps Porzingis, I would say. But the fundamental concerns, the consistency of their defensive effort, I don't really have reason to buy into that mm -hmm. anymore than I did this past year. And that was what killed them, I think, in some of those early games against Miami. Their ability to avoid those offensive slumps and the fact that they don't have that consistently great half-court offensive engine. Jason Tatum, I just don't think is quite there with his inconsistency as a pull-up jump shooter, with his inconsistency as a playmaker. And I do think that's part of the reason that the team as a whole can fall into these slumps. And... Can Jalen Brown consistently reach his ceiling? Obviously, significant struggles as a ball handler, as a playmaker in this run. I also think there's a bit of regression in terms of depth here that mm -hmm. losing Marcus Smart, losing Grant Williams, who at the very least was a playable wing. I don't like, I know that you don't like Grant Williams, but I mean, is Sam Hauser better, Logan? Sam Hauser can shoot. Sam Hauser's a UVA alum. He's okay, got that. Grant Williams can shoot too. Grant Williams is like a bowling ball. Grant Williams is 40% from deep, buddy, and he's certainly a better defender than Sam Hauser. He's Batman. He is Batman, <laughs> so you better respect him. I think the talent, the ceiling here is undeniable, and that's why it's scary to have them down at three instead of higher, especially because this run was so weird. Like the Heat were plus 13% from deep against them in those conference finals. Now I think the Heat are going to have a lot more talent this year because of something that is impending. But still, if Boston can find their defensive ceiling from the 2022 season, if their stars consistently play up to their billing, and if they have like an average shooting run by their standards as a good shooting mm -hmm. team, they probably should be the favorites. But it is like you said. They're not on Philly's level. They have had so much more playoff success. They're just a better team. But it is hard to bet on things that consistently have not happened and have consistently brought them down just flipping. And, like, I was super confident that they were going to beat Miami this year, and it came down to their fatal flaws and Miami totally out-executing mm -hmm. them in a lot of those key areas. So I am also going to keep Boston down at three. Who do you have in your two spot? I don't want to be boring. At number two, I have the Miami Heat, the runners-up from this year. And I just think, again, Carson and I are acting under the context as if Damian Lillard is a member of the Miami Heat. But with Dame, I mean, he just takes them up such another level. I, 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 these numbers are insane to me. Damian Lillard, one of seven players, averaged 32-7 and seven in a single season. Uh, it was the most efficient 32-7 and seven season of yeah. all time, 64.5 true shooting percentage. Blazers had an offensive rating of 120.3 with Lillard on the floor. 
Uh, he was the third most efficient isolation scorer, minimum four possessions a game in basketball last year. He was the most efficient pick and roll scorer. They didn't have that. I love Jimmy Butler. I am as big of a Jimmy guy as anybody else on the planet. I'm, I'm, give me Jimmy. If it's a one-game set and you give me Jimmy. He's not a great half-court creator. Uh, you know, the likes of the Steph Currys of the world, the uh, SGAs, the, the Lillards. Lillard, to me, is a top 10 to top 5 guy in that regard. And he just takes their offensive game up such another level. You're not going to have these big lulls. You're not going to have to rely on Gabe Vincent, on Duncan Robinson, on Max Schroes making three pull-up threes a game. Like, mm -hmm. I, again, I want to I want to emphasize, losing Schroes and Vincent aren't just regular losses. Those are really good role players. But with Damian Lillard, you're not going to have to rely on them night to night. Mm -hmm. Dame is your dog. Dame is the guy that you bet on night to night on the offensive end. Jimmy and him, I think, are going to be able to work really well together. So... I like this bench too, dude. Again, you're losing elite shooters, but I think you've got more athleticism now on this bench. I think you've got guys who can do a little bit of everything. Caleb Martin is back. Josh Richardson is one of the best role-playing wings uh, on the market that they could have brought uh, back in. They get him. Jaime Jaquez is in here. Nikola Jovic is going to be on this roster. Well, now, those I was guys gonna, are both getting traded. I was going to say. If they have Dame. They're probably going to, some of these guys are probably going to get moved. Regardless, I, I still like their depth to an extent. And, I trust, I trust the Heat culture to get these guys to play winning basketball alongside these guys. They're going to hustle. They're going to play great defense. They're going to do what Spo tells them, and they're going to be able to shoot at a high enough level to where you're not suffering without Struess, without Vincent. Uh, the Dame acquisition is massive, and I think uh, with how consistently great Miami has been defensively, Dame clears the only question mark that you have about Miami moving forward, and that's reliable half-court offense. Uh, I love Miami next season if they can get Dame. I have them at number two as well, but to be clear, that is very much dependent on them getting Dame. 100%. If they don't, I wouldn't have them in my top five. Sorry, guys. I understand that they just made the finals. I just think so many elements came together that are not sustainable, right? Shooting 45% from deep in their wins over Boston, 48% in their wins over Milwaukee, the utter collapses that we saw from those two teams who will come back better prepared for those situations, even if they remain flaws in terms of their construction as well. But with Dame, I agree. I think that it addresses their biggest, most glaring issue. That offense started to crumble in mm -hmm. the home stretches of the playoffs. Like after they went up 3-0 on Boston, their offensive rating would have been equivalent to 13th of 16 teams in the playoff field. They couldn't pressure the rim. They didn't have that consistently great over-the-top pull-up jump shooter. And Dame would immediately become the best half-court offensive engine in the East. Like I think... Giannis is more limited there and beat in a playoff context is clearly more limited there. Frankly, I'm not sure anybody is really pushing him for that title. So that changes the dynamic of everything completely. Then you consider that they have one of the three best number twos in the league in Jimmy Butler. Some people might argue the best. I mean, his last two playoff runs, he has been the guy on teams that almost went to the finals and went to the finals. He's given you 27, seven and five on 58% true shooting with elite wing defense. So if you want to take him as your guy, I can't really hold that against you. And then you have a top three defender in the league, maybe the best, with perimeter hounds alongside him and a brilliant scheme. And you have the best coach in the NBA, which was a pivotal advantage to them throughout this entire run and legitimately won them games and series. And overall, you have the talent level now to where you don't have to be punching above your weight mm -hmm. and totally relying on coaching brilliance and unsustainable shooting throughout an entire run. They're going to have three top 25 players with very complementary skill sets. The phenomenal half-court scoring and playmaking engine with the big-time perimeter shot-making who will bring some more of that rim pressuring and Dame, the mismatch attacking, versatile scoring wing and Jimmy Butler, and then the all-around defensive weapon. And Bam needs to be more consistent as a high-end scorer, but there will be less of a burden on him and still has versatility there and obviously playmaking value, running handoffs and a very good screener and all these different things. And then I just think the, like, dog and execution advantages they have are proven and I will not discount them especially when they have the talent level that would put them in these conversations with these other teams anyways I do have some questions about them number one being the wing core right as you mentioned no more Struess you're probably giving up Hawkes and Jovic and maybe Duncan Robinson in a trade and so you're looking at Caleb Martin and Josh Richardson and Haywood Highsmith I think that can worth work. I think those are all guys who can play both ends of the floor and who can shoot, which is like the most important thing. But you're not getting a consistent high impact plus guy there. I know Caleb Martin had great moments in this run. I don't know that we can expect that level going mm -hmm. forward. So it's not a strength. I think it's workable. 
but it's not a strength. Question number two is going to be their shooting ceiling. They were the best three-point shooting team in this run, and that really is what empowered them to get to the finals. I don't know if we can quite expect that ceiling, but I do think they'll be a good shooting team again. And then question number three is size, and I think that that's what just made them completely outmatched against Denver, and that's the thing that they really have not addressed. They bring in Thomas Bryant, who's another playable big. I don't know that he really matters in a playoff series. They bring back Kevin Love, but again, he's just 6'8". Like, they are small. They are limited athletically. They're able to compensate for that on the defensive end of the floor, but I think, like, Gabe Vincent is a markedly better defender than Damian Lillard. Mm -hmm. We'll see what Dame looks like in a culture that really incentivizes and has these great defensive practices. So they might regress a bit on that end of the floor. But I just think with their playoff track record and the areas that we know they excel year in, year out, adding an offensive creator of this caliber, who will be the best in the conference to me in that role, with two other top 25 players, I just think that's tough to deny. So I think the Heat would be my favorite out East too. Not to have the top seed in the regular season, but to get through the grind of a playoff run. But number one, Logan, we're going to agree. Who do you have? I have the Denver Nuggets. You know, they're just going to be great again next year. I don't know what to tell you. It's yeah. kind of the boring answer. I wish I had uh, somebody spicy. All oh, the Lakers are going to be the number one team in the in the league next year. I don't believe that. I think the Nuggets are going to be really hard to stop. Jokic will still be the best, most unstoppable player in the world. Uh, something that uh, Jason Temp, ho uh, host of Hoops Tonight, friend of the show, uh, co-worker at The Volume, always emphasizes, too, one of the most important things. Jokic can stay healthy. He's a tank. He's always on the mm -hmm. court, too. And great basketball just works around him. You think about the runs with Rivers, with Morris, with Will Barton as initiators on the perimeter, right? You can just kind of throw in whoever you want, and it works. But... No, you've got a great core around him. Jamal Murray, arguably the best co-star in the league. They just complement each other so well. The pull-up shooting, the catch and shooting, the ball handling. He's insane in this playoff run. MPJ, I know he struggled in the finals. He's going to be one of the best players off of the catch. He's going to be a great rebounder. I was super impressed with how MPJ played team basketball, how he defended, how he rebounded, just his effort. I was concerned about that. MPJ showed that uh, during the run. Aaron Gordon, again, a piece that just fits perfectly I just don't have as many questions or variables about the Nuggets. My question for other teams is, who can guard Nikola Jokic? Who can stop Nikola Jokic? That's the big question. That's the big puzzle that needs to be solved. I think Anthony Davis probably has the best shot out west. Um, out east, I think the Celtics size-wise and athletically maybe have some answers. But that's the biggest question that needs to be answered. And I, I know that they lost a very important rotational piece in Bruce Brown, something they really haven't addressed uh, in the offseason. I certainly don't want Reggie Jackson getting a ton of minutes off the bench. Reggie Jackson is no. not the answer. I do think they need to find another reliable ball handler because Bruce Brown filled that role and more to perfection. Uh, I think you have good wings here. Christian Brown, Peyton Watson, Justin Holiday. They're playable. They're good. Christian Brown was great during the run. I still think they maybe need to find another bench ball handler. But that's not a deal breaker for me, and that's not something that's going to make me say that Denver is not my favorite. They've got the best player on planet Earth. They have great continuity. They have a great core. And they reached a really high defensive ceiling, something that I didn't know if they'd be able to reach with Jokic at the five spot. They were the fourth best defense in all the playoffs last mm -hmm. season. I think they can do that with effort, with energy, and with their size and physical advantages. So I just don't have that many questions about the Nuggets. I want to see how they go out and replace Bruce Brown, but that's kind of the only variable they need to address. Yeah, they definitely stand above the rest of the league right now, and there's a ton of clear areas where they excel. They have the best synergy and continuity of any team in the league, which I think was why they had such a seamless and convincing run throughout the playoffs. Now, the other thing is that they do have by far the best offensive player. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say by far. I think that Steph is still within striking distance, but Jokic to me, because of his physical imposition, his ability to create those high quality shots in the paint and his playmaking advantage over Steph does have that number one title and the best team offense with the surrounding weapons. I think that they have excellent shot making they have elite size and rebounding and they're capable of a high defensive ceiling mm -hmm. now I do think if we're going to look at any questions it is what you laid out without Bruce Brown can they quite reach the same level that they did in this playoff run on the defensive end of the floor I still think as a collective unit they have very good hands they're a very high IQ unit when they're dialed in and rebounding is definitely a strength of theirs but Bruce was one of the best guys in that unit he was a plus athlete he was another guy with great hands. So they have to supplement that. I do think that Julian Strother coming in is like an immediate 3 and D guy who can play very pro-ready. 
Peyton Watson, I do think, has game. He's athletic. I think he's a guy who can probably defend this season at a high level. And also, 43% from deep last year has some creation off the dribble as well. I think they will supplement the things that Bruce provided. I also think Jalen Pickett, who they got in the draft, very pro-ready guy, high-level pick-and-roll ball handler who was able to really dictate the pace for a second unit and get himself shots in the lane and facilitate at a high level. So, yes, the Bruce loss hurts. They are not going to find anybody who brings all the things that he did in one neat package like that. But I think they've done a nice job of getting supplementary pieces so that they're not just going to be totally missing the value that he brought. I think all in all, they're in very good position to run it back, added more shooting in the draft with Hunter Tyson as well. I think they've done a good job of addressing their needs, and nobody has an answer for Nikola Jokic in this offense. Like, I just fundamentally do not believe it. It was one of the greatest offensive runs that we've ever seen. The dude is exceptional out of every action, and there's just no answer. So I think the Nuggets have to be the favorite to run it back. So that's going to do it for us here today, guys. This was an absolute pleasure again. Thank you so much to Blue Wire for having us here in the studio. Summer League has been great, and we're super grateful to have had this opportunity. So, as always, if you enjoyed the show, you can find us on social media, Twitter at nerd underscore sesh, Instagram and TikTok at nerd sesh. You can listen to the show across audio platforms. And if you are watching on the Volume YouTube page or if you want to see the shows with video, you can subscribe over there. So with that, as always, I have been Carson Brabber. I have been Logan Camden. And this was Nerd Sash.